Chapter 3. Why are you walking like that? Sarah asks, annoyance dripping from her voice. Her eyes are scanning the hallway, taking in the sidelong glances and open stairs as we stride toward our next class. Walking like what? I leap diagonally, arms thrown outward, into the concrete square directly in front of her. She slams into my back with a grunt. Walking like this? She gestures at me, then zigzags her hands wildly in the air. Like you're playing some sort of crazy hopscotch or something. Walk straight. Stop being weird. You were doing this last week, too. She's really not happy with me, but strangely, I don't care. Oh, I've just got blisters from practice, I say, as I slide my left foot into an open space back on my side of the pathway. It hurts when I put my foot down a certain way. It helps to kind of tiptoe. I j point generally at my heel, the sight of the fake blister. You just look like a crazy person. Maybe find a Band-Aid? People are going to start looking at you. At us. She shifts her crossbody bag self-consciously. Sarah has always been attuned to our social standing. Where we sit at lunch, who talks to us at football games. I care, but in the general sense of not wanting to be an outcast. But for, the most of, but for most of our lives, I simply followed her lead. She finagles the invites to the cool kid parties, and I happily plod along behind her as we maneuver long, dark side, dark driveways leading to big basements and out-of-town parents. Sarah is the glimmering, sparkling headliner, a perfectly developed, closely curated representation of high school popularity. My job is to look nice, dress well, and not say anything too weird. Don't talk about school or books. I nod my head, pretending to take her advice. I have been evading cracks for almost four full days, and I can tell the difference in my brain. It feels lighter. The tumor is shrinking. I am healing myself. Each step over a crack is one of a cancer soldier's pills. Sarah mumbles a quiet goodbye, more a multisyllabic grunt than words, and veers towards the next class. She doesn't turn around when I yell, text me later. Her mess of curls disappears into the crowd. The school tap cafeteria is located in the heart of the campus in a cavern carnivorous building that is also home to the auditorium and band room. The enormous brick structure could pass as a cathedral if there were anything remotely attractive about it. Its sprawling ceilings tower 50 feet above my head, the chipping green and orange exterior paint from decades past reminding me of how old this school actually is. How many tens of thousands of students, some now much older than my parents, have lived out their high school years passing through these exact doors. There is the smell of pizza and chocolate chip cookies, the roar of voices, tension and excitement. A long white hand-painted banner screaming, Home of the Bulldogs, hangs above the never-ending row of burgeoning trophy cases, tagged here and there with permanent marker graffiti. The student population rotates through the lunchroom in three rounds between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. every day. In August, I hugged my friends and cross-country teammates, Jenny and Rebecca with glee, when we discovered we were in the same lunch round. It was a relief to know I would have someone to eat with all year. The only thing worse than walking alone is sitting alone. The cafeteria has a pulsing, raging heart. When you enter, you become part of the storm. And it's also one of the most dangerous locations on campus. Not only is the entire floor the same evil that spans all the classrooms, but the walls are covered in green and white ceramic subway tiles. I almost sense the beams of cancer radiating from the cracks surrounding me. They emit a constant low-toned static. The entrance is clogged and chaotic. The first lunch round is shuffling past the line of trash cans on their way to class, while the second round is stampeding forward toward 40 minutes of freedom. With a shove from behind, my face is smashed into someone's navy book bag. I teeter perilously on my tiptoes, trying to maintain a safe footing, swaying at the mercy of the mass around me. I catch occasional glances of my feet through the sea of book bags and bodies, but I have no control over them as I am pushed, pulled, and knocked by the crowd. I know I am stepping on cracks. I can feel them searing my toes. I can hear the cells in my brain pop, pop, popping into malignancies. The crowd thins and spats out into a space between two lunch tables. I come to a flat-footed stop. I stand frozen, breathing and recovering at the t as the tumor in my brain reinflates. My cells are the giant exploding bubbles in a pot of boiling water. The noise of the cafeteria echoes off the tile walls and back again. Looking down at my shoes, each planted across multiple cracks, I am slammed with an intense pain deep in my head that screams outward through my ears. The soles of my sneakers burn against the carcinogens. A slow, creeping feeling of doom rolls over the horizon. Alone, trembling between crowded lunch tables, I'm filled with a heavy dread. Looking at the cracks, it's, a horrible, it's horribly obvious. I just brought the cancer back. I am suddenly furious at myself, furious at my clumsy feet and gangly legs. I have ruined everything. The students sitting at the surrounding lunch tables begin to turn around and look at me. I haven't moved position since I lurched out of the crowd and, wrapped in my own riddle, I have no sense of how long it has been. Ten seconds? A minute? Two? Five? Strangely, it's not their curious stares or craned necks that draw me from my thoughts, but instead the quieting of their unusually all-consuming chatter. The loud laughter and raucous conversations thin out quicker as more and more heads pop up to look at me. The muscles in my body tighten under the weight of their eyes. 
Everything inside is inside me is screaming to save myself from the gossip, from the rumors. Did you see Allison at lunch yesterday? Out of reflex, my legs twitch, ready to move. Escape, escape, but I am trapped. To move and to stay are both equally dangerous. Remaining here, I risk pumping more cancer evil into myself. I risk even more embarrassment, more stairs. But to leave? To leave is cracks, steps, the unknown, book bags, accidents, the unpredictable. I look up, intentionally avoiding the eyes of anyone around me, and scan the cafeteria for inspiration. Fifty feet across the room, Rebecca is waving at me from our usual table near the soda machines. I glance away without acknowledging her. Heat radiates up my leg from the cracks. My head throbs against the hard kernel of cells taking shape in my temporal lobe. What do I do? Where is my protector? Frantic, I look around the cafeteria as if, be as if the being sending me secret messages might be winking at me from the corner. My previous moments of divine inspiration just appeared in my mind on their own. The dream, the alarm, the clocks, the cracks. But right now, everything is silent. I have no guidance, no cleverly hidden messages. I tilt my head back so I am looking toward the ceiling and close my eyes. Opening my palms to the sky, I stretch my arms out wide, imitating the worshippers on Sunday morning televangelist broadcasts. Something about it feels unexplainably right. I hope it is a sufficiently pitiful plea for help. Protector, please guide me. And in the back of my mind, with my eyes closed, my face turned toward the ceiling, I hear it. If avoiding cracks can help prevent cancer, there must be something else, some other action that also has an unknown meaning or power. Like a crack, it may seem arbitrary, but it wields a hidden magic. There have to be more secrets waiting to be discovered. I hold my plea stance like a yoga position, asking patiently for more. People shuffle by me on both sides, squeezing between my outstretched arms and the students eating at the cafeteria tables. Um, what's going on? A girl says to my left, from the seat directly behind me. Is she praying? Am I praying? I ask myself. Silence. I lean my head as far back as it will go and stretch my arms out completely to my side, palms up. I am begging for a message. It hits me. It's like I have discovered something I already knew. I immediately understand that the idea is perfect. It's not only avoiding cracks when you walk that matters, but also how many steps it takes you to reach your destination. If where you place your foot is important, clearly how many times you do it is just as meaningful. While still significant, avoiding cracks is only one part of the overall equation. I need to think bigger. If, after I step on a crack, I can still reach my final destination within the correct or safe number of steps, then the danger is negated. It is all so obvious. With a relieved sigh, I open my eyes and drop the pose. I have a way to escape my misstep and its attached death sentence. I have been given a second chance. But how do I know the safe number of steps? Where do I find this magical number? How will I... 42. The number appears in my brain. Its arrival sounds mechanical, like it was fed to me by the machines that spit out tickets in parking garages. The outline of the number blocks all the other thoughts. I know this is my safe number. I surface from my discovery to the burn of a heavy, newly familiar heat, the pointed stares of my classmates. I have just put on a show for at least 100 students. That girl is in our English class. No one moves. They are waiting for me to say something to explain myself. Eyes fixed, mouths open. Is that Allison? I have nothing to hide behind. No veil of an excuse. With a blank face, eyes down, I pivot on my back leg and move to tiptoe at the cafeteria. Alarms blare as I move my leg. 42 flashing behind my eyes. Count it. The message is a silent explosion, an angry voice over a police megaphone. My protector is screaming at me. One, I say to myself, as I place the toes of my left foot in an open tile, shifting my weight, I move my out loud. Two, I say, as I set my foot down. Three, four. The entire cafeteria continues to roar, but the two tables near the windows sit in awed silence, listening to me count. Louder. Five, I yell. Six. I place one foot in front of the other, methodically counting my steps, attracting more attention with each one. Bobbing up and down on my tiptoes, I've screamed my way to 12 before reaching the edge of the tiled floor. Safely in the hallway, I run to the woman's restroom, still counting out loud, and slam myself into a stall. It smells like cigarettes and urine. The tears start as I slide the metal lock into place. Winded, leaning lightly against the stall, I can feel where their stares had burned my skin. Kelsey Jameson was actually laughing, and Maisie and Madeline... I spent the night at Kelsey's home last month. We stayed up all night talking about prom, college, the future, eating pizza and Cheetos, bitch. I grab, dab my face with a wad of toilet paper. My phone vibrates. Rebecca, hey, is everything okay? What just happened? Me, yeah, fine. Completely forgot about homework for next class. Gotta do it real quick. I wonder how much she and Jenny could see from our seats as a wave of embarrassment sweeps through me. I stare through the tears at the back of the stall door. I know Kelsey is whispering with her lunch table. How many people will she tell by the end of the day? And what will she say? I can see her gossiping in the parking lot after school. She was like counting or something. A chorus of gasps. But not even counting, like yelling and tiptoeing. It was so weird. Sarah is going to hear about this at some point today for sure. I hit the toilet paper dispenser with a clenched fist. The noise it makes rings off the cinder block wall so nicely that I hit it again. Harder. 
A new emotion is flowing through my gut, pumping upward with a power I haven't known before. Anger. It doesn't matter if they stared, I roared to myself. They're the ones who are crazy. Walking on cracks all the time, they don't know. They don't even know what they are doing to themselves. I nod my head in agreement as the edges of my outburst slowly wear down. Fist unclenched, I pick at the top layer of paint on the bathroom wall. What they saw or thought didn't matter. It only matters that now I have the full picture. Now I might be safe. I use a handful of toilet paper to wipe my nose and bend down quickly to look under the walls of the stall. I'm alone, thank goodness. I open the door and tiptoe out. The bathroom is painted a sickly 1970s orange. There is a single fluorescent light hanging from the unfinished ceiling and exposed pipes. Three dingy mirrors sit above three pedestal sinks. I dab at the eyeliner and mascara puddles under my eyes. If I looked pretty enough, smiled big enough, I had thought this morning, maybe no one would mind that I tiptoed and skipped and jumped through campus. Clearly, that was wrong. The heavy wooden door swings open and Letitia Simone saunters into the bathroom, humming. She beams at me with a huge wave. Hey, happy Monday. Her face immediately drops when she sees I've been crying. Girl, what is wrong? I know you ain't crying in here by yourself. I smile at her before I can stop myself. Tisha runs the 400 meters, so I see her around the track and locker room every day. She has always been so unexplainably nice to me. No, I'm fine. I just kind of made a fool of myself at lunch. I'm being an idiot. I shake my head. It's not a big deal. I don't know why I'm crying. She tilts her head sympathetically. We've all had those days, baby. Trust me, I've definitely had mine. She crouches down so her eyes are in my line of vision. Tomorrow will be better. You know that. We hold eye contact until I nod at her. Good. I gotta pee. See you this afternoon at practice. And smile. Don't let that shiny hair go to waste. She shuts the door to a bathroom stall and resumes humming. With a lighter heart and the remnants of an involuntary small grin, I reach the bathroom door. Lunch is over and it's fifth period. I am heading to pre-calculus, my most challenging class. The only real threat to my almost perfect GPA. I hold on to the door handle without moving. Where do I find my safe number? In the cafeteria, just, well, appeared. I wait quietly. 57. It floats down into my mind like a gift with a parachute. I swing open the bathroom door with a new outlook. I've made a few embarrassing mistakes, but I'm fighting cancer. I am the holder of insider information about the true nature of human physiology. It's not going to be easy, and like Tisha said, it will always be better tomorrow. I count my steps out loud all the way to precalculus. I arrive proud of my life-saving efforts and with 12 steps to spare. The bell rings to end sixth, sixth period chemistry and the room shuffles into action. I linger, packing up my notes and textbook, waiting for my safe number to appear in my mind. As I pretend to fuss with the binders in my bag, it arrives, 68. Come on, slowpoke. Jenny is waiting for me at the door and points to her wrist. We have to get all the way to the gym on the other side of campus for dance class. Would you hurry up? Coming, coming, I mumble as I stand from my desk. One, two, three. I count my tiptoe steps toward her across the classroom. Jenny is in almost all my classes and also a member of the cross-country team. Although she is a much faster runner than I am, I do better than her in school. We are both close friends and fierce rivals. So did you finish your homework, she asks. What homework? 12, 13, 14? The homework you forgot to do? The reason why you skipped lunch with me and Rebecca? Her, question, her voice questions and assaults me. She's clearly annoyed. Oh, yeah, I finished it. Thanks. 20, 21. There's an uncomfortable silence. I know what's coming. Why are you counting? There it is. And I'm ready for it. Well, there are about 2,000 steps in one mile. I just want to see how far we walk every day in between classes. Don't you think coach would be interested? Um, I guess so. Isn't that what a pedometer is for? She pauses, looks at me, and continues before I can reply. So last night I was talking to Sarah, and I told her, Jenny continues her monologue as we maneuver through campus. 38, 39. She wants a new pair of boots for her birthday. 42, 43. But it's just so hard to find good brown boots, you know? 49, 50. Especially in this little town. 51. I stop. Jenny walks a few paces before noticing. What's wrong? What are you doing? I look it up at her. I only have 68 safe steps and I'm already at 51. Looking down the path, we are much further than 17 steps from the dance studio. I can't keep going without a plan. I forgot my calculator in Miss Matthews' class. I have to go back and get it. Your calculator? Just go back after school. You'll be late for dance. Students jostle between us and she is forcefully carried away with the crowd. I know she's going to be mad that she had to walk the rest of the way alone to class. Tell Miss Stern I'll be right there, I yelled down the breezeway. I need to be alone for this. I have 17 steps left to get to me to what looks like to be the distance of a football field. It seems unlikely, even impossible, but I have no other choice. The path is crowded. It is the peak of class change traffic, and I am being buffeted and nudged by the rabid mass floating around me. With an emphatic jump, I lunge forward and land about five feet down the path. My flailing arms swing wide and barely miss smacking a girl I don't know in the head. She glares at me and keeps walking. I lunge again, moving another five feet, 15 steps left. I am exhausted as my steps dwindle to five, then four. It is hopeless. I am nowhere near the dance studio. The class bell rang long ago, and I am completely alone outside on the concrete pathway. 
I extend my front leg out and then wiggle it forward against the pavement until I am in a near split. I plant my hands on the ground and scoot my back leg forward to meet my front. Three steps left. A stream of sweat begins to trickle down the side of my face onto my neck. I am moving slowly, the weight of the day adding to the gravity's effects. I extend myself into another almost split and then drag my back leg up to meet my front. Two steps left. My shoulders sag and I feel myself giving in to self-pity. Where is all this coming from? A week ago, four days ago, I knew nothing of cancer cracks or brain tumors. I half-heartedly kick my leg out for another split and find myself sobbing. None of this makes any sense. Where are, why are there safe step allotments? Why do cracks cause cancer? My friends, my teachers, they are noticing. They are staring. I don't want to count my steps. I don't want to avoid cracks, but how can I not? This is brain cancer. I crumble from my split onto the concrete and allow the sobs to take control. Confusion, fear, frustration pour out of me. Wiping my nose and my arm, I lie down on the concrete. The warm surface is soothing against my cheek. I almost forget that I'm Allison. There are brown loafers about six inches in front of my eyes. Gray denim. I lift my head a few inches to look up and framed against the sun is a letterman jacket and tousled with brown hair. Sam. Is everything okay? I lurch my torso up from the concrete, snot and tears covering my face. Me? Oh, hi. Yes, of course. My voice breaks slightly as I try to tamp down the raging tears. I, well... I look back down and quickly wipe my cheeks across my sleeve. It only creates a bigger mess. I can tell by the mascara now smeared on my arm. Gritty dirt mingles with the thick wetness on my face, and I smile blankly up at him. How can I explain this? His green eyes question me, waiting for a response. My mind racing, I open my mouth without a plan, hoping for the best. You know, I think I have low blood sugar. Ah, yes, well done. When I don't eat or something, I just fall like this out of nowhere. I'm so glad you found me. I look up at it again, a dainty maiden rescued by a preppy basketball-playing knight. It's never happened at school before. I half giggle, half exhale as I try to dab away the more obvious drops of sweat between my eyebrows and along my hairline. You really should get that checked out, Al. I blush at the nickname. No one else has ever called me that. His arm is extended down toward me, but I can't see his face against the sun's glare. I hold his hand as he pulls me to my feet. He smells so good. I smile at him. Probably should. An awkward forced laugh. We look at each other for a few moments and I give a small shrug. Ask me to ice cream. I will him. Invite me to your basketball game tonight. We make eye contact for th- for a full three seconds. He opens his mouth, moves the chalk, then closes it, tearing his eyes from mine. Well, gotta run to class, he says, as he gestures his arm to the right, and with a whip of his neck, flicks his hair out of his face. Yeah, yeah, me too, I fidget with the corner of my binder. See you around. He walks away from me down the pathway, and I can finally relax. I let out a long, stale sigh and realize I've been holding my breath. I don't move. Can't move. I only have two safe steps left. Out of my peripheral vision, I see Sam pause as he rounds the corner and glances back at me, frozen in place with dirt on my forehead. My smile remains plastered on my face, my waving hand still suspended in the air. It tingles where you touched me to help me up, his fingerprints glowing coolly on my skin. I want to cry. I have to cry. Again, my chest shakes, my breath catches in my throat, but there is nothing there. I know that tears would help at least a little bit, but I'm empty. I need more steps. When I accidentally stepped on a crack, I was saved by introducing a second, more difficult requirement, reaching my destination in a certain number of steps. If you obey this new thought, then you are forgiven for stepping on that crack. It was like a trade. I gave my protector something else it wanted, and I gained back my health. I feel a tentative edge of comfort as I realize this is my way out. I can barter for more steps. I look around for ideas. What would my protector want? It needs to be meaningful. I want to demonstrate true sacrifice. Show him that I'm not just trying to gain more steps, but also thanking him for his protection and warnings. I scan my body. Shoes, legs, shorts, arms, lunch bag. Lunch bag. I've already eaten most of the contents, but there are still grapes and pretzels inside I have saved to have as a snack before a cross-country practice. As my stomach sends a pang of hunger, hunger through me, I know I have found the answer. I whisper out loud, I won't eat my afternoon snack if I can walk safely to dance class. A window of hope opens wide inside me. I have another tool, another weapon to fight against cancer. My glimmering happiness tells me my protector approves. Still avoiding cracks, I walk casually toward the dance studio, counting out loud with a new safe number. I roll the top of my lunch bag down tightly and shove it into my book bag. Sarah, is everything okay? Me, yeah, I'm fine. Why do you ask? Sarah, I ran into Sam. He asked you if there was something wrong with you. Like, mentally. 